And when you do innovate, not only are you creating a solution in the outside world for the betterment of yourself and for other people and other systems and wildlife and whatnot, you're also changing the structure of your brain. And now for something completely different. Welcome to Surrounded by Idiot Radio Podcast. From the Java Bud Studios in beautiful Scottsdale, Arizona, this is the Surrounded by Idiots Radio Podcast. Back with you, Tony Dufresne, PhD. Great to be back with you. For those of you listening in real time, I'm so sorry. I'm a little bit late this week. And it's because of uh, a couple different reasons. The first one is, is that I've been trying to figure out this whole camera situation. Uh, and my webcam just was not coordinating well with my audio. So it, it turned out to be just a disaster. So I had to upgrade, and so I've upgraded the camera. So I'm going to be on YouTube now, again, consistently. The second reason is because I got a whole new mic system. Because, you know, when things go, they usually go all at once. There's a law, and I can't remember the name of it. I do. I just don't want to say it. But that's what happened. So it's taken me a couple days to regroup. But the system's set up. We're ready to go. And this week, I want to talk about a... uh, hellish nightmare of a vacation I took once up on the Kings River in the uh, Fresno area of California and how that relates to becoming a more enlightened thinker. And this all started just a few days ago when I was reading this article in Quartz, which is an amazing online magazine, by the way. And it was about this guy, he's Duke University thermodynamics expert. His name is Adrian Bajan. This guy's a big time guy big time sciencey guy he won the um i think the franklin institute medal for his flow theory turn physics principle and he calls it constructual law if you didn't fall asleep in that last sentence don't worry about it i'm not going to go way into the sciencey stuff about that it is a brilliant work if you are fired up about that kind of stuff though and you want to read through it it's uh, again it's adrian bajan and he did the uh, flow theory and i talk about flow all the time It's a common thread with most 17th and 18th century philosophical thinking as well as with Buddhism. What he found was all systems, regardless, I mean, natural systems in nature, in your body, you, political systems, financial systems, they all follow a natural design principle of flow. Now, he used, and this is the reason why this crazy story about this vacation came up. He used the example of a tree that fell into a river, jacking up the whole river flow. But once it's pushed away, the water flows more freely. And basically, the waters have become liberated from their constricted flow. And that freed area now attracts more movement. And as a result, the surrounding area benefits. So basically, you take away that hindrance. You take away the block you allow the flow to happen, not only does it benefit that immediate water that was flowing, it also benefits all the waters, all the molecules that are coming down the river that haven't hit that point yet, as well as helping the whole system in and of itself, helping the whole river do its thing and transfer the sediment down river. Now, what the thing that caught me was the fact that they had this tree in the river and flow and then uh, it, it taking it away and everything being better. Because when I was at the Kings River many years ago, and I should bring my daughter on because she went with me and she was young at the time and brought a friend. Oh, man, it was brutal. Uh, one of the worst, if not the worst vacations that I have ever taken. But my friend invited me up. He had he had some friends that I've never met before. And they were up at the Kings River up on it's a Sierra Nevada River. And they were going to be in this campsite. And the guy that uh, my buddy knows has a boat and so what they do is they just you know you pitch the tent and everybody kind of gathers around and then you have the boat and you can shore dock it right there just kind of bring it up on the shore and you just go on little rides up and down the river basically it's just an excuse to drink a lot of Coors Light which for the record is the official river beer of anybody that has ever grown up in Southern California so get there and I'll spare you the other details because that's those are stories for another time but the point of this is we decided to go on a little booze cruise once we got there. And uh, so we all kind of piled in, probably six or seven of us. And it was a nice boat. And we rolled off and we're just, we're pounding our Coors lights and kind of putting along. And the guy went up and around the corner 
and he cut the engine. And I thought, what the hell's going on here? And he goes, well, I have to, we have to sort of paddle through this area. And I thought, okay, well, maybe it's like really shallow and he's got to pull the engine up because he started pulling the back engine up. And uh, what he said was, no, it's not shallow. He said, up here, there was a tree that fell across the river here. And we ha- and it's like just about, I don't know, about a foot underneath the water. And we have, and I can't run the motor. So we have to pull the motor up and we have to like just skim right over the top. And he said, I had to do this every single time. And everybody that went down the river at that area did the same exact thing. But he said, and this is the last time I'm going to do this because I have a plan. And his plan was to get rid of the tree. And he uh, brought a chainsaw with him. So the next day rolls around and we got into the boat and we cruised down over there. And he had his chainsaw. We were kind of holding the boat where it's supposed to be, you know, paddling here and there. And he got up on the bow and started that chainsaw up and started to try to chainsaw. Well, I don't know if you've ever chainsawed in the water, which I'm betting you haven't because nobody in the right mind would do that. But what happened is, is that because the water is, is so dense that it just stops the chain. So we were deeply disappointed. And during that time, we kind of cruised and on the way back, we we're trying to think of kind of a different way to go with it and I don't remember there's probably four guys in the boat and I don't remember exactly who came up with it precisely I think it was more of a amalgamation of everybody's ideas at that time but we kind of thought it's got to be something that we can create enough you know pressure with to be able to saw that sucker because it was a pretty decent size trunk somebody came up with a whole thing about a cable and then putting like a like a wheel on it or something and spinning the wheel or whatever so we Got out and went down to, I forgot the little town. They had a hardware store there. Got this cable and this little thing where we can kind of spin it around this wheel thing. And so the next day we rolled out there and and gave it a a shot. And the first time it didn't really work because we had the wrong angle. But eventually it actually worked. I can't, I don't know exactly how long that thing was there at the river and that everybody did the same thing. But for some reason this guy wanted to do this and and it the first time it didn't work but we kind of got together and did a little thinking and innovated a little and ended up figuring out a plan and what happened was is that once that was gone then everybody could just roll on through and there was no more impedance and it benefited not only this guy who now knows that it's not there and he can just keep rolling and not have to worry about doing all that stuff. It benefited everybody else. And it also benefited the flow of the river, which is the exact, it's not even a metaphor for what Bajan was talking about. It's actually an actual real life thing for Bajan's metaphor. And I think that can be perfectly applied to everyday life and every and the flow in where you want to go and what you want to do and how you want to open yourself up to innovation and to creating things and to be a creator and I I think all of us here have that sense of wanting to create in some form or fashion and make the world a better place and going through that process that thinking process that expanding out of just the basic solutions that most people go with when you find out that doesn't work for you then you have to find a different solution look at things from a different angle and when you do innovate not only are you creating a solution in the outside world for the betterment of yourself and for other people and other systems and wildlife and whatnot, you're also changing the structure of your brain. And here's what he says. Bejan says, when a single individual becomes enlightened, and that's what he says, through the innovation and through creating those solutions, you become enlightened. When a single individual becomes enlightened by knowledge or by realization, it creates new connections and new fortifications in the brain's synapses. So a bunch of previously unrealized connections in the brain may then follow so that the flow of thought is more evolved. You're like putting your plug in different types of sockets and actually creating new sparks. Because in that process, there are countless neurons that are connected to one another in the brain's cortex. And one connection at one point, which is that new idea or the new vision or a new concept, that one little part illuminates like the whole cortex 
and it flashes randomly, as you can see on MRIs. And that more numerous and more frequent flashing uh, makes an enlightened mind, which I think is absolutely fascinating. You wouldn't think that just sitting there and problem solving or, or creative thinking is going to change your brain. But it actually does. It like spans you to a level of enlightenment. Enlightenment's not just a spiritual concept. There's something to it and you can get to it through almost a mechanical process. There was really great research done by this lady named Carol Dweck at Stanford. And it's on growth mindset. And I think she has a book out. I have not read it. But growth mindset is really the basis of what I do. And if you want to achieve anything in life, if you're... If you're stuck in a smaller bubble and you want to expand your bubble, it's all about growth mindset. I talk about it all the time. It's about you know shifting perspective and, and seeing things differently and reframing. All that's growth mindset. There is a brand new study that's going to be published shortly in the Psychological Science Journal by Carol Dweck. And what she states is someone with a growth mindset is one who encounters new ideas with enthusiasm. And they don't believe there's just one area where they'll flourish. Their mind is open to new ideas and new possibilities. That's the attitude. That's the mindset that they have. These people are more realistic about obstacles that come along, and they're way more persistent learners whose work can ultimately be informed by endless perspectives, which means you're open to where the path goes. It's flow. It's all the same stuff. It all connects. Do you get it? It all kind of makes sense. Somebody with a growth mindset solves the problem of restricted flow and has a better chance of innovating. Because you can't solve the problem of a restricted flow. You can't get rid of the tree branch in the water with a chainsaw or by bending it, which the dude tried to do, you know, put a rope on the end and try to bend it. All of the attempts prior to that point, all the basic, typical ways of going about doing that, failed so it took innovation it took creating a brand new type of saw that also expanded my mind and everybody else on the boat who knew so to wrap everything up in terms of Bejan stuff that metaphorical tree that's blocking the river flow leads to a persistent and creative person to an innovation or an insight they push the tree out of the way somehow with thought and with application This, in turn, causes more cortical connections and more ideas to flow. It builds on itself. That, everybody, is the definition of expansion. And when you get to that point, it's not like, it's like riding a bike or tying your shoes. When you get to the expansion point, you're there. It's like taking the red pill. You can't go back into the matrix. That's the best part about all of this. You, you of course, have to continue to look at things in an expansive manner, in a reframing manner, in a in a multiple perspective manner, in more of an open manner like Carol Dweck was talking about. But the point is, is that that's the way out. That's the way towards enlightenment, whether you look at it from a Buddhist mentality or you look at it from just Western philosophy in the 17th and 18th centuries. And I can name off every single philosopher. It's like, a, it's like an all-star team of philosophers that believed in the enlightenment thing. It would I mean, take your pick. Descartes, Locke, Newton, Kant, Voltaire, Rousseau, Smith. Whichever one. They're, they, they all prescribed the same thing. And it makes perfect sense. And now we have science backing that up. Not only Bejan's thermodynamic constructural law that I've been talking about with the tree and all that, but also with Carol Dweck's research at Stanford regarding growth mindset. That is the key. Have a growth mindset. How do you get a growth mindset? You go, hmm, I think I'm going to have a growth mindset. And the reframing is I'm going to be open to things. If I want to find a solution, I'm going to find a solution. And it may take reframing or it may take looking at something from underneath and from flipped over. Reframing and taking a different perspective, you'll be able to find something. That's the whole point. And once you do, your brain expands. And then once you do, other people's brains expand. And life gets better for everybody. And isn't that really the whole point of all this? So my call to action today is a very simple question to you. And the question is, what is your tree branch? What's the thing that is there? What's the thing that is getting you to have to cut your motor and coast over 
and is a big hassle and is not allowing your flow to happen. And once you kind of get an idea of what one of your, if not your only, you may have one, you may have a number of them, what your tree branch in the water is. The second thing to do is accept the fact that there is a way to get rid of that thing. And then number three is start building your boat saw. I hope you enjoyed the show. Javabud.com, J-A-V-A-B-U-D, the podcast, everything's on there, the book. Also, Alexa flash briefings surrounded by idiots. Comments or questions, Tony at Javabud.com, J-A-V-A-B-U-D. See you next week. I'm too tired to pretend I don't want to be alone. I'm calling all friends.